This episode of the Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Robots. Did you know, for every 10 humans it takes to make a podcast, it would only take one robot. Try Robots today. Well, it looks like we have to go from our favorite insect, the monarch butterfly, to our least favorite insect, the spotted lanternfly. Good Wednesday morning, I'm Ethan Brown and this is Tip of the Iceberg, where I will break down some environmental news and then answer a question from our listeners on the air. Submit questions via Patreon, email, or social media. Patron questions go to the front of the line, so sign up at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. While the British invasion started out with the Beatles, the American invasion apparently started with the spotted lanternflies. In this case, instead of being in the sky with diamonds, Lucy's in the sky with a ton of brown, mushy lanternfly eggs. If you're not on the east coast of the US, or you are and just don't go outside, the spotted lanternfly is an invasive pest native to Asia, so it has no natural predators in the US. That fact, plus its uncanny ability to stick egg masses onto vehicles and hitch rides to new areas, allows the spotted lanternfly populations to explode. Just to clarify, it's leaving masses of its own eggs on vehicles. If it was leaving chicken eggs on cars, this would be a much different episode. I mean, the spotted lanternfly would certainly give the Easter Bunny a run for her money. According to the latest data from New York State Integrated Pest Management, which believe it or not manages more than just New Jersey residents, the spotted lanternfly is currently present in 14 states in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and starting to creep into the South and the Midwest. Some of the bigger invasions are in New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Jersey. Why they didn't invade New Jersey, take one look around and leave is beyond me, but I guess they just really like sketchy casinos and industrial plants. Quick sidebar, I know we're supposed to hate the spotted lanternfly for how invasive it is, but can I just say, does anyone else think it's really pretty? Like I know I've seen it be toxic to other people, but I don't know, I feel like I could fix it. Why does it matter if spotted lanternflies are everywhere? While they aren't toxic to humans, they do create problems for a lot of other plants. For one, spotted lanternflies feed on many important crops, vines, and trees, and in a weirder twist, they also poop a sugary liquid called honeydew. And honestly, naming insect poop after the world's fourth grossest melon makes complete sense to me. I mean, if the liquid coming out of the lanternflies was called coffee or birthday cake Oreo, then I don't think we'd have as much of a problem. Lanternfly honeydew promotes the growth of black mold on plants and prevents sunlight from reaching the leaves. Some of the affected plants include apple trees, cherry trees, peach trees, and grapevines, all of which are really important food sources, with grapes in particular serving the multi-billion dollar wine industry. I mean, you know the song, right? Bum 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 ba dum a spotted lanternfly walked up to a lemonade stand And he said to the man, run in the stand, hey, bum 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 Got any grapes? The man said, literally, get out of here. I know you're going to secrete some nasty shit 
open and ruin all my crops. Also, this is a lemonade stand. This song came out in like 2010, maybe earlier. Like, what is the duck just going around telling people I have grapes? Like, uh, literally, I don't. Like, I never have. Ugh. God. F yeah. Watch out, lemonade stand owners. In fact, according to researchers from Penn State, if spotted lanternflies were to spread through Pennsylvania, the expected losses to the state's economy would be nearly $554 million per year and potentially lead to the loss of 4,987 jobs. The lanternfly causing mass unemployment is just one of many reasons we will never elect it for mayor. And unfortunately, climate change threatens to make our spotted lanternfly woes a whole lot worse. If we look at the spotted lanternfly life cycle, they hatch their eggs in the spring, reach adult maturity in the summer, and then lay eggs throughout the late summer and fall. Around November, the adults will lay new eggs. The adults then die off listening to Jimmy Buffett cover bands, while the eggs survive the winter and hatch the following spring. So with climate change creating earlier springs and longer summers, that actually elongates the spotted lanternfly life cycle. The eggs start hatching earlier, meaning the adults are around for longer, meaning they have more time to secrete honeydew and eat all the grapes. Not to mention, with spotted lanternfly populations having fewer Geminis and more Tauruses, we're going to get a lot more influencers and teachers' pets. Climate change also aids the spotted lanternfly in spreading. Regions that were once too cold for the spotted lanternfly to set up camp are now becoming warm enough to host them. I'm on the West Coast now, so I can't speak from personal experience about the way spotted lanternfly awareness is being generated. But in reading news stories and hearing from friends, it sounds like there's been a large focus, at least publicly, on individual action. There's been a government-led campaign called Stomp It Out, which is teaching individuals how to identify a spotted lanternfly and then kill it. And while I know stomping seems like the easiest way to kill a bug, I think governments ought to consider giving people some options. I mean, maybe they can make a game out of it. Stomp it to start. High. Score. 30. 8. Stomp it. Twist it. Pull it. Pull it. Stomp it. Stomp it. Twist it. Yow! Now all the peaches are gone. But even if they missed a bop it sized opportunity, raising awareness and involving individuals is a cool thing. My one concern, though, is whether or not the bigger picture is getting communicated to people. Individuals stomping spotted lanternflies alone will not fix the entire problem. It also could lead to people accidentally stomping bugs that aren't lanternflies. Or sometimes, maybe, someone will not be wearing their glasses and they'll see a cashew on the floor, and even though they're in California where there aren't any lanternflies, they'll go, Mayday! Mayday! It's a lanternfly! And they'll squash it victoriously until realizing it was a cashew. That could, um, maybe happen to some folks. That said, Motivating individual action will help, but it will certainly take a lot more effort than that to get the situation under control. And smart people are working on that. You can scrape eggs. You can put traps on tree trunks. You can develop shrink ray technology and send our country's best trained soldiers to fight them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And there are some pesticide controls that can be targeted and effective. Now, before you run screaming because I said the P word, let me go back to the life cycle for a second. 
Spotted lanternflies hatch in May and are an issue during the summer. Bees and other pollinators are doing their work in the spring when the plants are flowering. So while there certainly are other downsides to pesticide applications, pollinators should be in the clear. And if you don't overspray, you can limit a lot of the other adverse impacts as well. With that in mind, there are neonicotinoid pesticides and these target all insects, but again, because of the life cycle, there might be a strategic way to use it. Or not, just an option. My shrink ray idea seems pretty good too. There's also more targeted pesticides, such as pyrethroids and neem oil that could help. Both of those break down pretty quickly, so they wouldn't accumulate in the environment the way neonicotinoids do. Again, all options, all valid choices, just one is clearly going to have the best theatrical experience when it comes time to make a biopic about this event in 20 years. And before you even ask, yes, Addison Rae is going to be playing the Spotted Lanternfly Queen. There is also a lot of research being done into longer-term solutions to the Spotted Lanternfly invasion. For example, USDA scientists have conducted surveys for natural predators of the spotted lanternfly in their native regions in China and have identified a couple of wasps. Now, bringing a new wasp into the United States has the potential to create problems too, but there are studies in progress as to how safe or effective this approach would be. Other studies are looking at just basic biology and behavior of the insect, improving monitoring, more targeted pesticides, and creating chemicals that rather than killing them directly, cause them to stop eating and starve. Which, like, I don't know why you need a chemical to do that. Just give them a contract with Next Model Management. And of course, the other big one is actually getting climate change under control. You know that historically simple task? That alone won't fix the issue either, but it will prevent it from getting a lot worse. And since spotted lanternflies have captured people's attention, I really hope it doesn't stop at just stomp it if you see it. What really would help is for people to understand what these solution ideas are and how much money they cost. If the Pennsylvania economy has half a billion dollars per year and 5,000 jobs on the line, I think people might want their governments to throw some money at this problem. It's also a great simple example of how climate change hurts the economy, and there's never a bad time to get that message across. So again... I'm not in a state experiencing a bad spotted lanternfly invasion or just stomping on random cashews over here trying to help. But I was concerned to find all the top headlines talking about individual action and not as much about the large-scale efforts. I really hope through this process, people can learn the big picture of the issue too. It's a good educational opportunity. It's certainly more exciting to do your part if you know others are working on the issue too. And if we succeed, we can ensure the world's cantaloupe to honeydew ratio doesn't get too out of hand. When you imagine a machine-driven future with few human workers, don't you also imagine robots making podcasts? Well... You should. With their 99.9% .9 accuracy and charming personalities, robots would make the perfect podcasters. Plus, they will have a lot to talk about once they start taking over, functioning human government, and start leading a technological revolution. They won't just drone on about the boring stuff, though. Robots will also want to podcast about The Bachelorette, The NBA Draft, and misunderstood moments in robot history. Robots, the exciting future of podcasts.
The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to Tip of the Iceberg. It's time for Ask Me Anything, where our listeners get a chance to ask me any environmental questions they may have. Submit questions on our Patreon, email, or social media. Patron questions go to the front of the line, so be sure to sign up today at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. Today's Ask Me Anything comes from John Kubation, who asks, We often look at what environmentalists can learn from other disciplines such as econ, but I don't know if I've seen the reverse explored much. What is something that has been solved or discovered in the realm of environmental studies that other disciplines would do well to pay attention to, integrate into their theories, or learn from? Thanks for the question, John. This is actually a really difficult question. I got this one months ago and have kind of been sitting on it. And I think what makes it so difficult is that at least in my view, environmental studies isn't a discipline in the way a lot of these other subjects are. The best analogy I can think of right now to use the framing of your question would be, salad gains a lot from lettuce, but what does lettuce gain from salad? I know that sounds bizarre, but hang in there with me. So what does salad gain from lettuce? Well, lettuce is part of salad. You take lettuce out and the whole thing is different. And that's kind of how I see environmental studies. It's not one thing. It's biology, it's chemistry, it's physics, it's geology, it's economics, it's political science, it's history, it's geography, it's international relations, it's anthropology, it's engineering, it's math. It's a whole list of subjects all mixed together and used to answer a specific set of questions. How does the natural world work? How do humans interact with it? How can we interact with it better? And if you pull any one subject out, it's not the same thing. So I almost hesitate to say environmental studies learns from other disciplines, because I think it goes beyond that. I think environmental studies quite literally is all of those other disciplines. So if we flip that and say, what does lettuce gain from salad? Well, salad makes it taste better. Salad gives it a bigger purpose. And that's kind of how I see something like economics or biology or what have you gaining from environmental studies. Pretty quickly into my first economics class in college, we were looking at examples and problems from the environmental world. Why? Because those are really important questions. They're questions that affect everyone. And I have no doubt that's a big part of why I ended up enjoying my economics classes in college. So taking the question very literally, I know that's not the most riveting answer, but I think what other disciplines gain the most is a really important application. Building off that point, and again, this isn't some sort of academic theory, but I'm always blown away in interviewing professors on this podcast how much the interdisciplinary aspect of their work stands out. Environmental studies or environmental science are relatively new college majors, so professors we have on typically have a background in a specific discipline. And I find that when I ask a scientist about policy or I'll ask an anthropologist about biology, they very quickly jump in and say, that's not my area of expertise. And being self-aware as they are, these professors are always collaborating with folks from other disciplines on their research. Half the academic papers I read in researching this podcast have like 20 authors on them. Sometimes I get a sense that there's a perception out there of the emboldened, unwavering climate scientist who thinks they know everything and I don't really know where that came from. 
Certainly in my experience, every expert in academia that I've come across is really committed to listening to folks in other disciplines and not overstepping into subjects they're not trained in. And this kind of extends in an interesting way to global governance. If you listen to episode 60 on rethinking UNEP reform, UNEP is the United Nations Environment Program, and it is a much smaller UN body than, say, the World Trade Organization or World Health Organization. And the founders of UNEP designed it that way intentionally. They didn't want UNEP to act like the expert on everything. They wanted UNEP to be nimble and find other organizations to partner with on various issues. That, again, gets at this idea that the environment isn't just one discipline. It takes a lot of experts from a lot of different fields to actually understand. So maybe that's what other disciplines could learn from, actually. How do you be more interdisciplinary? There's a lot of questions out there, not just environmental ones, that require a variety of perspectives. I think environmental folks have done a fairly good job at bringing in people from all different backgrounds in academia, and I'm sure others could take notes from that. It's definitely one of the reasons why I enjoyed my environmental major. Thank you so much for the question, John, and thanks to all of you who listened to Tip of the Iceberg. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. You get merch, bonus content, and your questions move to the front of the line for Tip of the Iceberg. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET Group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you on Friday for a deep dive on cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency.